Hello, this is Nabia Jenkins Johnston. I am the senior conference producer for events at wealthmanagement.com, specifically focusing on inside ETFs, wealth stack, and retirement income edge. I am happy to welcome you to the Inside ETFs podcast. Hello, and welcome to a very special episode of the Inside ETFs podcast. I could not be more excited to be with you all live from the New York Stock Exchange. This session was pre-recorded on November 7th, live from the upstairs Siebert Hall panel room, thanks to Doug Jonas, thanks to Metal, thanks to Alex at the New York Stock Exchange, we're able to bring together Brendan Ahern, who's the chief investment officer at Crane Shares and author of ChinaLastNight.com, Simeon Hyman, CFA, global investment strategist and head of investment strategy group at ProShares, and Devon Drew, chief executive officer for DFD Partners. This is one that you will not want to miss. Hello, all, and welcome uh, to the Inside ETFs Advisor Roundtable. Uh, we are here today live from the New York Stock Exchange. Very excited to have our guests on either side of me. I actually will start out by telling you a little bit about what we will be doing next year at Inside ETFs. We are very excited to be launching an expansion of the Inside ETFs brand, which will focus more on general allocation strategies for investment as a whole. And what we plan to do is to educate advisors on what is coming next. Uh, we can think of no better guests to help us on that path. So without further ado, I would, uh, I'll jump right into uh, introducing our guests. Uh, starting out, Brendan Ahern, Chief Investment Officer at Crane Shares and author of ChinaLastNight.com. We also have uh, Simeon Hyman, uh, who is the Global Investment Strategist and Head of Investment Strategy Group at ProShares. Thank you for joining us, Thank Simeon. You. And last but definitely not least, Devon Drew of DFD Partners. And what's very interesting and special about this conversation is that we get a chance to link what I like to call, you know, maybe the three eyes of inside ETFs for me. I think about the importance of insight, right? It's one of those really key factors in investments. We want to be able to look forward and understand what is coming next. Uh, but the next eye is really important as well, and that has to do with intuition. Sometimes it's the insight that leads us to intuition, to sort of have an inkling and a knowing of what we should be doing and what direction to be going in. And I like to think that if you have insight and if you have intuition, you get innovation at the end of the day. And that's what we really want to provide is greater innovation. So we will be discussing today kind of three key spaces that I like to think of as emerging strategies, emerging markets, and we have uh, representatives here to talk to us about that insight and that intuition so that we can create some innovation on stage right here with you. So I am actually going to start uh, with Brendan. Brendan and I have worked mm -hmm. together quite a bit. Crane Shares is a wonderful partner, but also a real leader in terms of subject matter expertise for what it means to work internationally. What does it mean to delve into emerging markets in places like China and to have the infrastructure that supports that? So, Brendan, I wanted to start out and sort of ask you a little bit about the big picture looking ahead for 2024. What is the status of emerging markets and, and, and China in general from an investor's perspective? What should we be looking uh, forward to for 2024? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, you kind of bring up this idea of intuition, which, you know, our brains are genetically wired to find quick solutions for sometimes complex problems. And I think... You know, we see right now a dramatic underweight in not just China and emerging markets, but non-US equities amongst US investors. And that's 
That's driven by from the global financial crisis low. So going back to March of 2009 through the end of October, the S&P 500 is up 725%. And people say, well, China's only up 129. It's, it's uninvestable, mm -hmm. right? That, that they're communists, they're anti-capitalist. And that explains this huge, dramatic disparity in performance. But, but the reality is this underperformance isn't unique to China. That MSCI emerging markets is only up 183%. And, and in fact, MSCI all country world XUS is only up 228%. So, so what, what's happening? How is it that only the US is outperforming every other stock market in the world. Right. And, and I think, you know, my little joke is, well, you know, Harry Markowitz, the founding father of diversification, died earlier this year. But for many investors, diversification died a long time ago because 14 years of underperforming, right, that's 56 quarterly client calls or board meetings, trustee meetings. What's, what's, what's happening? And it's... it's What's really driven this performance disparity is the growth orientation of the U.S. stock market. Mm. That, that technology has driven the U.S. equity outperformance, and other stock markets don't look like the U.S. Ten years ago, MSCI China was 50% in two sectors, financials and energy. And you throw in industrials, materials, real estate, other value sectors, that explains this underperformance, that MSCI China was not a very good transmission vehicle for investing in China. You know, no correlation to the GDP. And the same was exactly true for MSCI emerging markets, that if you bought these broad-based building blocks, and to prove that these would be like, well, what did a growth sector do? Well, obviously tech. So MSCI EM tech, actually went up more than the S&P 500. It actually went up 800%. Right. And MSCI China Tech went up almost 1,700%. The problem is tech was only 11% of MSCI emerging markets 10 years ago. And in China, tech was 2%, literally 2%. So, so, so that's part of what Crane Shares is about, is, is giving investors the growth orientation, the growth factors, the growth sectors within China and emerging markets. And if you went out and bought, you know, got that, that growth, you actually did really well out in non-US investing. But if you bought the broad building blocks, you know, you, you might have paid nothing, but, but you got nothing for it. Right. This is really interesting because I like to think of the stories that we tell as lessons Right, a little bit about the history of, of, of the markets and what that tells us about the future. If there are sort of if there are recurring trends that we can continue to see, then we're also able to learn from them, mm -hmm. right? And I think what's interesting and part of what I love about having conversations with you is that you're always tying together what we are able to learn, what the glitch is, what the per, perhaps the the, the specific missing link is in our understanding. So I'm really excited to hear that perhaps technology is this missing link. This is the key in sort of being able to read, right, the writing on the wall. Mm -hmm. I thought that it would be interesting as we talk a little bit about technology and we talk a little bit about this sort of key link uh, this ultimate change factor, if we could call on you, Devon, and ask a little bit, because we know that you've been working in the AI space, you've been working specifically on a project of your own, right? I, I saw on Devon's LinkedIn a new stealth partnership, and I'm just going to leave it at that. <laughs> but we've had the opportunity to watch you continue to grow with DFD partners and now really be in a space where you can speak to how AI is directing decisions and strategies around general allocation, around investments for next year. Can you tell us how these spaces connect 
what we should be looking forward to? Can you give us the technology missing link so that we're able to make better decisions for 2024? Yeah, absolutely. And kind of the way I see it is, is AI will be bridging the gap between assets and wealth. And I think that theme will continue to play out, not just in 2024, but onward and upward. But before you can even have that conversation, there needs to be a significant investment in the actual infrastructure mm -hmm. that is necessary mm -hmm. for AI. So one thing that I, I look at and pay attention to is, is okay, well, as the electricity needed for, for one search compared to one, one AI search compared to one Google search grows exponentially, the need for on-premise data centers is going to is going to continue to grow, right? And and what does that mean for for every firm that's in that's employing these large AI deep learning models? That means that you're going to have to make a a distinct choice to either go on cloud or on-premise, mm -hmm. right? And if you're going on-premise, that means that you're going to have to be able to have potentially thousands of square footage that's going to be necessary to, to have these customizable servers, which are going to allow you to, for redundancy, because if you have redundancy, that means it, you're, you're going to ha it's going to be less likely that, that these servers will fail, right? Yes. So first and foremost, being able to have the actual data centers to be able to bridge the, those gaps, right? And then once that is attributed, then all of a sudden you could start leveraging these deep learning models to identify what the next allocation should be, right? Now, in order to do that, you have to have millions of data points. You have to be able to tie in 13F data, ADV data, sentiment data. You're right. going to have to have behavioral trends. You're going to have to cross-reference that with different home office reports and, and, and reports from the gentlemen that are, you know, that are here speaking today. <laughs> but that all needs to happen real time. Yes. Right? And the only way to do that real time is to leverage deep learning, neural networks, computational data science to be able to deliver what the end investor is going to, not, not, not going to have to be, oh, well, it'd be nice to have. It's going to be, you have to have it, right? Which is going to take millions and millions of dollars of, of investment from our industry and in, in a forward thinking mind. I absolutely love all of the information that you packed into this succinct description, right? We're learning about intuitive, we're, we're learning about intuitive learning from the perspective of AI. We're also talking about all of the data that is feeding, right? This, this understanding that, that these bots are, are giving us deeper understanding, deeper knowledge, but we also need to focus on what we're feeding, right? What we're feeding uh, the, da the data, the AI, the science, one infrastructure, but also our own information is what is driving all of these processes. And I think it's really interesting to think about perhaps even what AI might, might lead us to for our own allocation decisions. So what, what decisions could we possibly see coming out of greater learning from, from machine learning, right? Uh, so I think that's really interesting. I am curious, as we are now talking about infrastructure and we're talking about real estate, and we have talked a little bit about what it means to perhaps think more globally, I, I want to ask you, Simeon, when you look at the next steps, the next uh, the next brand new thing, the next uh, emerging space, where do you think that might be? And are you interested in terms of your work at ProShares? Have you had uh, connections and conversations around AI, connections and conversations around perhaps expanding more globally? Uh, what's your experience and what's sort of your general thinking there? Sure. Appreciate everybody's time. It's about balance, I think. There's a lot of innovation that can be applied to traditional asset classes, mm -hmm. and, and I think that shouldn't be ignored. Stocks and bonds are still the foundational piece of, of folks' portfolios. But what we found at ProShares and others have found is that the strategies that people have deployed to invest in stocks and bonds, old school active management, if you will, uh, can be perhaps improved upon um, 
by a rules-based discipline, you know, old factor analysis or dividend growth strategies. In the past, if it was just five or 10 years ago, you'd have somebody kind of rolling up their sleeves and using it as a screen and then kind of going in a room and thinking about what they might want to do. But I remember back when uh, a couple of rolls ago, uh, I was running due diligence at uh, right. one of the large wirehouses. And you know it was our job to vet the managers who came in with their separately managed account mutual fund strategies. And we would ask a question of ourselves, let's plot this person's strategy on just kind of a line and say, what proportion of their process was a screen? And, and then what portion happened afterwards? And we like the folks who were like 80 or 90% screen. And then they did a little stuff in a room when they were done. Yeah. Why? Because they wouldn't wake up in the morning and just decide to change their stripes. Mm. And so I think a lot of the, the uh, opportunities that we're all talking about are opportunities to, to leverage technology and discipline to what was previously a, a craft, if you will. Mm -hmm. So that, I think, is an a very important opportunity. But that doesn't mean there aren't emerging asset classes that are out there. Uh, we at ProShares have uh, a, a growing suite of crypto-linked ETFs that we think are really important. Right. Uh, and it's back to the Markowitz thing that uh, Brendan brought. Uh, that was It was sad that Harry Markowitz passed away this yeah. year. Uh, really a guiding light for many of us. Look, when you find a asset class, or just call it a thing, and it can be a volatile thing, but if it zigs when traditional asset classes zag. You take a volatile thing that behaves a little differently, you just got to sprinkle a little bit of it into a traditional portfolio uh, to add diversification benefits. So we think of both of those elements of ProShares, opportunities to innovate within traditional asset classes, mm -hmm. but absolutely look for emerging asset classes as well. I love this, and I think that this is a little bit of the future that we see for the old school 60-40 model, which I now think we're just throwing out the door, <laughs> our ideas about what creates longevity and, 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 and real sort of insight and wisdom for the future, all of that's changing, right? And I think there needs to be balance between an approach that has a little bit of a, a risk tolerance and also sees the benefit of looking back. I am curious, as we have these sort of three subject matter experts on our stage in these very different areas, if you can perhaps give us some guidance into perhaps what it is that we can be doing now to prepare for 2024. So if we are looking at uh, questions about our clients' uh, retirement portfolios, or we are looking at uh, a strictly accumulation phase, and in 2024, folks are sort of looking for a crystal ball, and they want to look a little bit into the future and see what to do next. What can they do to prepare now for what is to come? What do you see is, is the, next, the next thing, the next wave, whether that's something to prepare for from a position of caution, or whether that's something that's an opportunity to take on? And I'll start with you, Brendan. Okay. I mean, I think going back to our conversation that the, you know, this incredible outperformance of U.S. equities has led to this huge home bias. And that, that's true not outside of the U.S., that you know, my travels of meeting with institutional investors on every continent other than Australia and Antarctica this year, they're all overweight U.S. equities. I mean, I asked them, I said, you know, what... And that's, that's just because this idea of 14 years, 56 quarterly, uh, quarterly board of directors, right? And, and, and what's interesting is, you know, this idea of market regime change. Are people prepared for it? You know, that this U.S. equity market run has been aided and embedded by a very strong U.S. dollar. And I, I kind of ask these investors, you know, what if... What are you prepared for the next decade? And they'd say, well, the next decade will probably look like the last decade. And I say, well, what about the decade before that? Right? From 1999 to 09, U.S. equities performed, had a negative return 
non-U.S. equities, including EM and China, vastly outperformed. Mm -hmm. And many U.S. investors gave up on stocks after two bear market drawdowns of 50, 50, more than 50 percent. You know, 2000, 2001, and then 2007, U.S. equities dropped 50 percent, right? So people gave up on U.S. equities, and that actually laid the foundation for this period of U.S. equity outperformance, in my opinion. Hmm. And now I would just argue that the tables have turned, that, that for U.S. equities, they faced a little bit of a headwind, that the U.S. has become highly indebted. You have some political dysfunction, and non US at, at the same time, combined with very high valuations, rising interest rates, right? High interest rates are bad for long-duration assets. The S&P 500 is a long-duration asset, hmm. uh, just with its overweight to technology and growth stocks, the, you know, Magnificent <clears throat> Seven. And are investors prepared for non-U.S., EM, China to outperform? I'd, I'd argue no, not at all. And, and if the dollar goes through a period of prolonged weakness, I think that non-U.S. equity outperformance can happen. Uh, the, you know, the, you know, a lot of what was going for the U.S. is gone away, and I'm not rooting for that per se, but I'm just saying there's very compelling opportunities outside of the U.S., and no one owns any of it, none of it. Like, it's all been kicked to the curb. You know, 56 quarterly meetings, it gets weaned down, and then it's gone. So I, I think the foundation for market regime change is there, and people aren't prepared for it. This is incredible. And I think that uh, this is what we hope to, to hear on the stage at Inside ETFs is where we can go next and where maybe there is a frontier that is wide open. So al although there are challenges, we see on the other side opportunity, Yes. right? Uh, Simeon, we really haven't had a chance to dive in because, of course, I know and, and some of our audience will know also about the incredible work and the depth of the work that you've done in terms of the crypto market, but why that comes to mind as I, as I uh, listen to Brendan talk about brand new opportunities is because we've had a lot of conversations around whether crypto is an opportunity or whether it's something to avoid, right? And whether there's sort of a little bit of fear around this space and maybe inside ETFs is about quelling fears giving you enough information to make the right decision and go in the right direction. What can we learn? What lesson can we learn from ProShares' involvement in the crypto market and, and perhaps what we can do next for 2024? Sure. There's a puzzle here. We, it's, it's not as though there's been great news flow around cryptocurrency. Uh, there's some guy who's got a lot more hair than me who's in a little bit of trouble lately. It's been on the news a lot. <laughs> And you know, there are issues in crypto exchanges. Things are not quite working exactly the way maybe they were supposed to work. And there's this high interest rate thing that was supposed to be a problem. So you got all this hair on the space, and yet Bitcoin is more than doubled this year. Exactly. And Ethereum is right behind it. Mm -hmm. So that's the challenge, because you're looking at this as an investor, and you're saying, it looks like it might be here to stay. Uh, it's rallying in the face of adversity. But how would I invest in it if these ways of investing it seem to be challenging to me? Uh, you know, what we found at ProShares is that there is a mature piece of the, I hate this word, but I'll use it anyway, the ecosystem, uh, the futures market. Bitcoin and Ethereum have mature futures markets where the Futures market is a regulated place. It's a place where you post margin, all sorts of good things. Uh, and if you put those futures in an ETF, you have a robust solution for investing in cryptocurrency and taking advantage of its underlying resilience without having to worry about some of the other stuff about how you do it. BITO, BITO, mm -hmm. is uh, our ETF. We're super proud of it. It's the largest crypto-linked ETF in the world. We've been running it for two years. People say to me, they, they ask questions about Bitcoin and about forks and knives and spoons and halvings mm -hmm. and quarterings. 
I know a little bit about that, but at ProShares, we know a heck of a lot more about how you run futures-based ETFs. And we think the solution is proven efficacious. And that's always the challenge. When you find these new opportunities, sometimes the opportunity is visible but the investment avenue isn't clear yet. Yes. And that, I think, is, is, is what we're all about, is trying to figure out those solutions. How quickly can we get people access to those opportunities? I love this, and I think that we are in an interesting space. We're in an interesting place in 2023. In, in our conversations in May, we talked a little bit about the market. We, we talked about uh, over and over and over again from 2022 into 2023. Are we in a bull market? Are we in a bear market? What should we be doing? All of this anxiety around these decisions. And I think that one of the things you just brought up that's really helpful for me is that we need to accept a little bit that we may see a bit of the future, not all of it. We may know the right direction, but the path hasn't exactly opened yet. The right vehicle is not there, but at least we can think about uh, the right direction to go in, right? And so we, we're prepared when the avenue does open, when the opportunity does open. I'm curious, Simeon, if you perhaps have a question for the gentleman on either side about how working together, right, in this space, we can prepare our audience a little bit. Are there questions that you have when you think about AI or questions that you think about when you think about emerging markets? I feel like we have a lot of silos that often develop. Is there anything that you're sort of interested in? I will pass the mic to you and give you sort of an opportunity, <laughs> right? Scary. <laughs> give you sort of an opportunity to do what we hopefully provide at our conference, which is step out of the space where you are the subject matter expert and then get the expertise that you need from, from, from those that lead in a different way. Sure. You know, I'd, I'd love to ask about on, on the AI front, one of the questions that's, that's been in my mind is how do, you, how do you isolate that investment opportunity? I think about blockchain and uh, anybody remember the blockchain funds from five years ago that were just banks? In, how do you know when an opportunity is going to manifest in a benefit to disruptors and you can sort of isolate them or when a new technology is going to benefit incumbents and you can't isolate it? Yeah, I mean, I think about when you talk about the infrastructure, I, I could speak about what, you know, what we're doing and how we're isolating investment opportunities, right? So what we're currently doing to identify these investment opportunities is leveraging these learning models to be able to clearly articulate what should be an advisor's next best allocation, right? So, and the way we're able to do that is taking all the rhetoric from the home offices from the, and also the pro shares of the world, cross-referencing that with, you know, let's say an advisor's current book of business with 13Fs, uh, different portfolio construction tools, and to be able to extract what we call like a, a, pro, a profile match score to say this advisor has a higher propensity to do this type of business based off of all these all these all these metrics, right? And if you're able to do that, what it takes out of it, it, it takes the bias out of it because currently it's like okay, you have X amount of wholesalers that are trying to push this product, right? You have your pro shares guy, you have your you know you have your crane shares uh, wholesaler, or trying to create the rhetoric of what they should be buying, but let's remove the bias, right? And let's, and let's train these models to take what you guys are saying, right? And also take what the home office is saying, and then being able to leverage the preferences and parameters of what they currently are looking for to identify a certain asset class. And then once you're able to identify a certain asset class that's the next best all allocation, then you're able to really cross-reference that with specific advisor preferences to say, hey, these are the five or 10 funds that kind of fit there, right? And what that does is it saves advisors time, money, and then resources. And then if you look at kind of a question that I have for, for you, if we, could, if we could do that, you know, I, I love what you, what you mentioned about Bitcoin, right? And I love how you mentioned about BITO. 
One thing that I am paying close attention to is the latest Schwab report when they surveyed 21 to 42 year olds. And they said, what is your top five holdings in your, in your uh, retirement account? I just saw that. The fifth was GBTC, right? Could easily be BITO. But I think that speaks to the overarching issue that we have in our industry, right? Because if we're not thinking outside the box, if we're not looking in opportunities in China, if we're not looking in opportunities in uh, futures-linked ETFs, then we're going to miss the mark because the next, the now and the next generation are looking at investment opportunities much differently than when I was growing up in the business and we were all growing up in the business, right? So I think that I think it's. Um, a missed opportunity if we're not looking outside the proverbial 60-40 because we know the people that are going to be clients for our, for our clients for the next 10, 15, 20 years are thinking about things differently. Do you guys feel the same at ProShares? The challenge for us, and we have our wholesalers out there, is to find... To, to get that opportunity to have the conversation that you're talking about, mm -hmm. uh, to find someone who's going to sit with you, and it doesn't have to be a half hour, but you just want to have right. that three, four, five minutes, the old funnel. We've we got to find some people, and we got to get a little bit in the funnel, and then just be able to have a long enough conversation to talk about the, innovative, the innovations that we have and how they can help an advisor create solutions for, to your point, people who are just a little bit younger than me, who, who acknowledge that they're going to need to plan for the future and, and plan their portfolios and construct their portfolios just a little bit differently than, than folks did even just 10 years ago. So it's always a challenge for us. How do we get that three to five minutes to have that conversation? And that's, that's gold. That's gold. Mm -hmm. I, I love this. And I think that and Devon, thank you for your question because I think that that <laughs> a little off script. <laughs> no, we're, that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing here. We're we're about having conversations. We're about getting great minds in the same room and having them learn from each other, as we said. And one of the things that you just mentioned to me, and I think is a really important part of what makes any kind of event successful, which is that opportunity to have that meeting, to have that face-to-face, -to, -face, to be able to connect one-on-one, -on -one, to be able to meet the people that you need to get the information, that new news, that tip that's going to make a difference for you. So I, I, I'm excited for us to have some of those opportunities at Inside ETFs. We'll have opportunities to have direct meetings for you to be able to connect directly with those advisors um, in the room to be able to uh, share a little bit of your knowledge and be able to, in a way, really direct the future of allocation through some of those conversations. Brendan, we don't want to leave you out in this question asking. And now mm -hmm. Simeon has asked a question. Devon has asked a question. <laughs> And, and Devon, I haven't, I haven't forgotten about your outlook, right? And you're giving us your, your AI and tech sort of outlook for 2024 and what we can do. But I am going to intercede and sort of let Brendan perhaps discuss some of the gaps in, in the knowledge for what it means for Crane shares to look out into 2024, to grab that technology piece, to perhaps look a little bit at crypto and fixed income that are right up Simeon's alley. Mm -hmm. What questions are on the top of your mind that help to put all of the pieces of the puzzle together for you and open season with either Simeon or Devon <laughs> uh, to ask your question? Yeah, I think it's for us, we've put a huge emphasis on creating quality research to earn the trust of investors. And you, you push that out and hope people read it and get intrigued or we stimulate something that they say, OK, uh, you know, I, I got to re-scratch that itch <laughs> and they proactively reach out. Uh, but that's that's very hard, you know, that that we we have these firewalls or you know, uh, you know who reads an email from people you don't you don't know, or who answers the phone. Like I, I look at my phone when a phone, and if it doesn't have a contact related to that phone, <laughs> I'm not answering it. Exactly. You know, so, so yeah, you know, we are clients of Devon's uh, firm in full disclosure. But I'd be kind of curious, you know, 
you know, how, you know, what are the best practices you're seeing, Devon, across your clients? Like what's, you know, you know, you know, the, you know, I think what's exciting is you have firms like ProShares, CraneShares, others creating these, you know, cool tools for, for investors. But, but if, you know, how do you gain mind share? How do you gain you leverage technology to get in front of people? Uh, obviously, inside ETFs is one such opportunity. <laughs> uh, but, you know, are there things that you're seeing that maybe are a little bit out of the box? Or what's, you know, what's, what, what, you know, what's working? What isn't? You know, what, what should change? Yeah, I don't think there's enough emphasis placed on the resources for the folks that are going out telling stories, right? And those are those are the investment consultants or the wholesalers, right? So I think thinking thinking about best practices, being able to find that affinity between the firm, the fund, and the wholesaler is what we need to do in an ever competitive environment to be able to allow them to get the well, it's probably like 10 minutes at this point, right? With a, you know, with an advisor. On the flip side, I think there needs to be equally enough emphasis put on what they want to see, mm. right? Too many times we're going after our own best interests. And one thing that we try to do within our platform is, cre is, is create that curation for these advisors based off of their touch points and their social engagements, right? So what we were able to do to help firms like crane shares is to create the Netflix approach to the advisor community. It takes a differentiated approach to be able to penetrate the minds, the mailbox, and the portfolios of these advisors nowadays. I mean, they're in any given day, they're getting hundreds and thousands of emails and calls. Everyone has a, has a great solution. Everyone has a you know, a China fund or, mm -hmm. you know, or, or this fund or that fund, right? right? So, but how do you break through? And I think what we're missing as an industry is there's just too much friction. And that friction is based off of the fact that there's no mutual alignment in the conversations or relationship. I love this. And I'm going to now ask a follow-up question. Talk to us about the Netflix approach. You know what? You have to, so for, first and foremost, right? We're all in a industry where we're seeing great change happen, mm -hmm. right? So the latest forecast is what? 43% of, of all advisors will be retiring in the next 10 years, right? That's roughly $10.2 trillion. So what you're going to see is that great attrition. You're going to see tremendous amount of M&A activity. You're going to need, and this is all going to happen at warp speed, right? right? So everyone is comfortable now, especially millennials with the subscription type models and business models, right? Right, And being able to leave impressions and, and cookies based off of where they're clicking, they're more comfortable with that, right? So being able to cater to that, right? If you're, if, if, if you're spending 33% of your time on FinSub.com and you're looking at emerging markets, well, we wanna be able to potentially take that data and, sh and show you some emerging markets, mm -hmm. right? If, if you have a high propensity for you know, let's say Bitcoin, but you're not sure to access it, we want to be showing you the ProShares approach, right? Right. And what separates ProShares. And what that does is it aligns the ProShares and the crane shares with the advisor. So no longer are, I think, the future of wholesaling and, and asset management and the relationship with, with wealth managers is like, hey, listen, don't call me unless you know what I want. Yes. Right. And if you call me and ask and ask me for apples and I want oranges, we'll never be able to talk again. Right. So it's going to have to take that differentiated approach. And when I say Netflix, mm -hmm. I know my Netflix looks different from Simeon's Netflix, mm. looks mm -hmm. different from, you know, Brenda's Netflix. And that's and I and I firmly believe that that is the future of distribution and also the future of how these advisors come to find their investment solutions as opposed to just a couple clicks and filtering, filtering things down. Because when that happens, you miss, you potentially miss alpha. Yes. And I, I love this. The future of allocation, the future of investing is about customization and personalization. It's about knowing your customer, right? And so from the advisor's perspective, they are knowing their client better, but also 
in terms of uh, several of us uh, sitting on this stage, we are knowing the advisor before we even get to that first conversation. So I think that that's a really interesting next step. Simeon, I, I'm curious what your thoughts are as you hear Devon talk about, you know, even, even some of those cookies being uh, a part of the conversation. There's information that happens before we even get to that meeting. What are your thoughts about ways to perhaps capitalize on this, ways to use this information, and, and what, what's your comfort level on, on getting to those meetings and already knowing about the apples rather than the oranges? You still need stuff. Yeah. I think that's part of that. That's, we can't forget that. So as Brendan said, research is still important. You, you have to have information to share. And the insights that you have to share might not be landing exactly right on each and every person, but you still have to have it. So we spend a lot of time working and thinking through how our strategies are operating in different environments to make sure that we have the content that can then be filtered out and targeted to folks very effectively. Mm -hmm. And you still need to just use the broad information to guide you. As an example, we know everybody's thinking about income these days. Everybody's thinking about income. So, okay, we got to think about that and come up with a little bit of a research point of view. Well, is income from stocks the same as income from bonds? It's funny that I heard the word duration used with respect to the equity markets. Right. That's a little funny, though, because there's a big difference between stocks and bonds. Stocks grow. Bonds don't. People have totally forgotten that in this environment. So we sit back and say, let's remind people of that, because that's a thing. So in other words, and we'll spend some time doing some research to make sure that people understand the difference between stocks and bonds and looking for opportunities in stocks to make sure that your stocks are growing something. We love stocks that grow their dividends, as an example, because if you accidentally buy stocks that aren't growing, right. then you might as well have bought a bond. So I guess the point that I'm trying to make is you still need to think about the broad trends that are out there and develop points of views and develop solutions that are responding to the broad market environment so that you have the stuff to deliver on a customized basis. So you still can't quite do the stuff we've been doing for years, but man, the right. deployment of it, the targeted deployment is invaluable. I love this. I think that what we're seeing is we need to have all the shelves at the supermarket stocked and then let people, you know, really choose what best suits them. And I think that makes a lot of sense in terms of strategies for moving forward. Brendan, I thank you for essentially asking Devon the question that we had left over in terms of the future um, of, you know, what we can look at for 2024 and his perspective on, on how technology comes in and how uh, data and AI and personalization comes in. But I'd be remiss not to ask if there's anything you wanted to add to that, Devon, that maybe you haven't discussed. Yeah, so I just think so many companies, it's just in their best interest to stay private for longer. Right, so I think that there is a, a really strong opportunity for the end clients that have a longer time horizon to increase their allocation to alternatives. Mm -hmm. Right, the average advisor allocation is at three percent. Right, I think that's woefully um, under under allocated based off of the all the really interesting vehicles and products that these asset managers have within the within the alternative space. And then not only that, just the way you can get access to these differentiated investment solutions now. Like, you know, we're fortunate to be in the New York Stock Exchange, right? I've seen I've seen a global music ETF come to market here at the right. New York Stock Exchange. I've seen <laughs> the first ever electricity futures ETF come to market here at the Stock Exchange, right? So it's like it's getting easier to access these differentiated and alternative investment solutions. And I think advisors need to take a long look at what that means for the overallocation. And then from a generational standpoint, you see millennials invest three times as much in alternatives and their baby boomer counterparts, right? So it ends up being kind of like a business risk if, you, if, you, if you're not having those conversations and educating yourself on uh, investing in alternatives. I love this. And I think that 
that that's what we want to do. We all want to be educating ourselves, especially on those areas where we are less familiar. I am thrilled to have this conversation kick off uh, our, our, the upcoming year uh, of, of Inside ETFs. We don't have Inside ETFs exist in a vacuum in May, uh, but it's really a 365 um, evergreen conversation around what is next, what is new, and what direction to go in. Uh, to that end, we'll, we'll have opportunities for our larger audience to chime in, uh, one, via social media, some opportunities to ask questions after our uh, conversation's been, been, been released through the Inside ETFs podcast. Gentlemen, I have rarely enjoyed a conversation more. I have really been honored to learn quite a bit myself from each of you during this conversation. And I think that our audience is especially better equipped to move forward with the right thinking about strategies for allocation. So we've learned here a little bit about these emerging spaces or these spaces of risk, and we've learned more about the market outlook for 2024. Once again, thank you to our guests, Brendan Ahern of Crane Shares, Simeon Hyman of ProShares, and Devon Drew of DFD Partners. Uh, we're very excited for what's to come in 2024 with Inside ETFs as you lead the charge for subject matter expertise. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. This has been the Inside ETFs podcast. We're so happy that you joined us and can't wait to speak with you again. 